Hey, hello everyone and welcome to Unlimited Seating. I'm your host, Sanila Samuel. I hope 2022 has started out well for everybody listening. I'm so excited about our episode today. My guest today is Maya Itani. Maya is a managing director for Itani and Company, a UAE-based brand and marketing consultancy. Maya is also the co-president for the Dubai chapter of Elevate Network. Maya, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thanks for having me. Uh, podcasts like this are so important on so many levels, and I'm honored to, to be invited. Great. Hey, Maya, I, I am looking forward to, all, to you sharing all your experiences with us today. So I'm going to get started, right? Share with us, Maya, where you started out in your career and to um, how, what are the different moves that got you to where you are today? Sure. So I graduated from the American University of Beirut. I am Lebanese. And straight from there, I landed a job in sales uh, in the UAE, working as a part of the, as at the distributor for Procter & Gamble. So I'm a marketing major, but it was always recommended to us to actually begin in sales, to truly see how the consumer behaves on the ground. And so that was a fantastic introduction to the UAE market to really see, I, I was managing Spinney's at the time as my client. So handling the beauty portfolio for Procter & Gamble in all of the Spinney's outlets in the UAE. So I saw a lot, you can imagine, and it was a fantastic experience. And within a year, I decided, okay, I've gotten my taste in sales, which had really sharpened a lot of my skills. And uh, now it's time to go into actually what I studied, which was marketing. And then, so there I moved from um, my current role into a role with Beiersdorf, the skincare giant that has brands Nivea, Labello, Eucerin, La Prairie, uh, it's a, and uh, there I truly learned and immersed myself into the marketing FMCG world for the next few years. I mean, these were the formative years of my career where I really learned how to, uh, how brands are built from A to Z, how we, you know, start from consumer insight all the way to a product launch, roll it across markets. I was handling up to 69 markets at one point in my career, everything from, you know, I was, I was uh, handling Turkey and South Africa and trying to, you know, obviously with a global brand, you have to understand how do I roll out the same product to two very different, you know, not just two very different markets, 69 very different markets without, you know, applying stereotypes, et cetera. So that was a fantastic phase in my career. Um, you know, FMCG is a school for anyone who's been in it. That's what we always say. And after a while, I, I was feeling a bit burned out. I was, you know, um, in my mid twenties and uh, it sounds really silly now to say in my mid twenties, I felt burnt out, but you know, when you're in you know, high school and university, you really focus on your extracurriculars as well as what you do at school. You really think about uh, who am I outside of my career, outside of my, high, my, my educational career. You don't define yourself by the fact that, oh, I'm a high school sophomore or a senior and you play sports and you do activities and you do art and, or whatever. Um, and then you forget all that when you become an adult. It just becomes that you, you become super dedicated to building your career and you forget that you're a human being outside this nine to five. So I started looking, you know, instead of when I was feeling that way, I started looking for things to reignite my passions. I was a volleyball player. I um, loved theater. So I was looking for things like that. And I found it really difficult to find adult level classes or sports groups or things like that. And this was back in 2012. So there I kind of had the spark of an idea of creating a platform in which we could collate all of the different adult level classes to really encourage people in the UAE to remember who they are outside of their nine to fives. And I launched a tech platform called The Curve, which was um, really bringing together all of these UAE classes and everything from photography to flower arranging to you know, different sports, um, physical activities, all sorts of stuff, um, even how to quit smoking, you know, all sorts of different really interesting classes. And we created a tech platform and I ran that for multiple years, which was an excellent experience. I call it my MBA because it was really my first taste of entrepreneurship. Um, I did end up leaving my corporate job at the time to pursue that full time and dove into the unknown. You know, tech wasn't a big thing back then. Uh, being a female founder in tech was a completely different world. Um, and I learned a lot. I learned a lot about business development, about 
building a brand from scratch. And that was my first experience as well, not working for a multinational. It was really a big step to go away from being part of a big brand and being able to introduce yourself as, hey, I'm so-and-so, I work for this massive company that gives you automatic clout. Whereas when you step away and you start your own business, it's like, who are you again? (laughs) And it's, it's like, I literally am the same person I was yesterday. But because I stepped away from this massive multinational, you have to rebuild from scratch. Um, And so while that was an amazing experience, um, I I didn't really feel at home in the tech world. I didn't uh, want to continue my career in that that, uh, way, even though the business had been accepted into an accelerator program, we had won awards. It was, I mean, it was fantastic. It was on a great trajectory, but I was really longing to return to marketing. I was longing to to kind of go back to that world, um, which was, I mean, it was the feeling that that I was welcomed because obviously I felt burnt out from my experience. Um, and then, so I, yeah, I decided I took a little break. Well, at the time, I was having my first child. I took um, less than a year maternity leave, and I decided, you know what, I'm going to return back to corporate marketing. I this is really what my passion is. Um, I'm truly interested in this. But I kept hitting a wall. I kept hitting a wall, finding that now that I'd become a mother, the interviews were totally different to the way they were in my early 20s. Um, the questions that I was being asked about how I plan to return to work, how my child is being taken care of. I mean, these were mind blowing questions that I was being asked in interviews. So very, very blatant, um, you know, gender biases, uh, straightforward, you know, uh, prejudice. And so what I ended up doing at the time, as I said, I need to prove that I'm still sharp in this industry. I need to show my skills. I need to be able to demonstrate because I'd also stepped out and done tech for a few years. So I started a blog in which I started posting, um, you know, marketing tips and tricks for SMEs, because in my time running my tech business, I'd met so many small business owners and mid-sized business owners homegrown you know businesses and they all had one thing in common is that none of them knew how to do marketing and that was one of their biggest shortfalls and they kept trying to do it on their own so I started this blog with the hope of using it to land another corporate career right (laughs) to land another corporate job like this was just a tool a gateway to be something to point at to say look you know I know what I'm talking about I'm still fresh (laughs) and then Lo and behold, one day I get a call saying, hey, uh, we've seen, you know, your post on LinkedIn or et cetera. And uh, can you come consult for us? And I was, I was kind of blown away. I thought, uh, and this was my first moment of what do I do here? Do I say I'm not actually a consultant? Do I just roll with it? And I decided to take the scary path and say, okay. And sent a really big um, proposal with a really high fee that I thought they'd never accept and was shocked when I got the yes. Yeah. Uh, I kind of just stood there when I got the, the acceptance <laughs> email. I said, what, what have I gotten myself into exactly? <laughs> I don't know how to be a consultant. Um, so that that's what began you know, in 2015, um, what is today uh, our branded marketing consultancy. Okay. That, that's a really good story. I see like you're a total <laughs> self-starter. <laughs> Well, an unintentional self-starter, put it that way. <laughs> I do get what you say about the like the interview process. You know, I moved years ago with my husband over to Dubai. Uh, I quit my job, moved with him, and he got a job here. And I think for a year, I could not find a job. I, I don't know how many interviews uh, I'd been to. And a lot of the times I got asked questions like, oh, how long has it been since you got married? Oh, so then you're going to have a baby very soon. You, and it just comes out of left field you're not really expecting it so you don't know how to respond the audacity <laughs> yeah. the audacity of the questions is incredible <laughs> i mean a, one man said to me he said how old is your baby and i said she's nine months old and he goes, i just you know i just can't picture it i just can't picture you being focused at work and i received a rejection letter from them saying you're the perfect candidate you have the right skill set we know you'd be an asset for the company but we can't help thinking about the pressure this would put on your young family. And I just, my jaw dropped thinking, what, what, condes- what a condescending email to send. You're more concerned about my family than I am. Yes. 
Yes. I mean, so yeah, the audacity of some people in the interviewing yeah. process. Um, yeah, I guess we learn and you, you, you kind of change it completely and, and, and took charge of, um, took charge of your destiny. So that's great. Yeah. <laughs> Try. <laughs> so who are your, like I said, you're a self-starter, you, you're clearly very enterprising, right? So who are your role models then, uh, Maya? Yeah, so I have wanted to run my own business since I was probably eight um, <laughs> because that was always instilled in me from a young age. I really credit my father um, for building this entrepreneurial spirit in me. I mean, he's not an entrepreneur, he's a surgeon, but every time I had a crazy idea, he'd say, what's the plan? Figure it out. Tell me what you're going to do, what you need to make it successful. And write, he'd make me write a business plan. And so that was so influential in so many ways because he wasn't scoffing at my idea. He was um, understanding that, you know, maybe I'm never going to make money, but the process of showing me, hey, I believe in you, figure it out. Tell me what the idea is. He bought me books on how to write a business plan. Um, and that really, you know, for, for someone who's an adult that you respect, especially, I mean, I'm an, I'm an Arab girl. I was an Arab, young Arab girl. And to have a father say to her, you know, you can do anything. It's only you who would limit yourself, but you've got to do the work. You've got to figure it out. You've got to write it down. You've got to plan. And then, and then we'll see, you know, how I can help. So it was never an outward, oh, you know, I'll give you the hundred, you know, I used to live in Saudi, I'll give you the hundred reals rather than you sitting outside the grocery store and trying to sell cookies. No, it was, yeah, live that experience, figure it out. Let's, let's, let's um, see what you learn from it. And, and that I, I credit that to, to my confidence, first of all, to, to have a father say to a young girl, I believe in you, hugely influential in my confidence. And to the fact that, oh, okay, all I have to do is kind of write a business plan and try to see what to do and um, go from there rather than be overwhelmed by the challenge of it. So that was like my first and foremost, the, the most influential person I would say for me to become an entrepreneur. Then from like a, the business world, once I became an entrepreneur, uh, again, role models who are women who you know, started the way I started are very few and far between, um, which again is why podcasts like this and other podcasts or you know shows in the same domain are so important uh, because we don't really see people like ourselves succeeding as as business owners. Um, you know when we hear terms like mumpreneur or you know uh, uh, side hustle or things that kind of minimize what female business owners are doing, a uh, girl boss like this these terms that I find really really. Um, you know, people see them as positive terms. I actually see them as setting us back so far yeah. because what you're implying is that this woman is mom first and foremost and preneur, entrepreneur on secondary on the side, you know? So that was the language that was really, really prevalent um, when I started my businesses. Not so much anymore. I think people have realized that this is not great language. Um, but, and so what the only, the, the real success story, the person that I saw doing things well, that I really admired was Sarah Blakely. And it was for many reasons, not only because she was a female entrepreneur, but because she was a female entrepreneur who wasn't really um, compromising her principles. And even today, like I've always kind of called her my business crush, but, you know, recently she sold her business and the way the stories that came up, how she sold her business. No, usually these stories are celebrating the individual, the entrepreneur, and she chose to flip the whole narrative and celebrate the people who helped yeah. her get there. Yeah. You know, that such a difference in approach, such a difference in, in, in leadership. And it was really heartening for me to see that because it shows you women don't have to change who we are. I mean, obviously not all women, that's a stereotype to say all women are, are cuddly and emotional leaders and yeah. people focused. That's a stereotype, but more often than not, women are relationship focused. They care about the people who work for them. And to see someone successfully build a billion dollar plus business without losing that, it's really powerful. Absolutely. I love reading the stories about um, Sarah and what she did for her team um, after yeah. um, the sale, right? Um, and I, I think just the way she talks about the story as well, and the, the same way that you talk about your story, Maya, there's a lot of 
um, inner messaging, I feel that that's really important to tell ourselves. I love the story about your dad, right? Um, mm -hmm. But that's also adding to how important those role models are for us growing up. Um, yeah. Even before we, as we are studying, as we start working, uh, to just be supportive, to be actually telling you to, hey, this is good, go figure it out for yourself, right? Mm -hmm. uh, not giving messages that are, hey, you can't do this, or are yeah. you sure you really want to do this? Uh, that, that role model piece is just so important. Uh, I love the stories about, about your role models. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I grew up with three brothers, so in, an, in the Arab culture, it'd be very easy for my family to say, oh, you're the only girl, um, you know, you can't do that, it's not the same, but I'm very thankful to have been born into a family where, you know, I'm equal, yeah. I'm, you know, just, you gotta, you, you gotta bring to the table what you think you can bring to the table, and, and um, your gender doesn't really have to impact that at all. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and um. I always talk with my guests about feedback, um, right, Maya? So for you in your career so far, what's been, how have you kind of gotten feedback? Is that harder now that you're an entrepreneur to get feedback? Uh, and so what's the toughest feedback that you got personally and how did you respond? Feedback is such an interesting thing and an interesting topic because um, it's what you hear, right? It's, you know, you could be sitting in an interview, pro uh, sorry, in a review process with your manager and they've spent, you know, an hour telling you how amazing you are. And then they give you five minutes worth of negative feedback and that devastates you, you know? And then yes. you're like, oh my God, you know, it's terrible. He, you know, this person doesn't think I'm, a, you know, perfect. And that's also, I think, a female, a, a more, a more so a female thing because, we tend to define, um, at least I'll speak for myself, I don't want to speak in general tones, but failure is very, like, it used to be so defining, you know, it's like, oh, if I fail, you know, when I, when I closed down my tech business, I felt like, oh my God, how am I going to explain this to people? So feedback is really interesting and, and understanding how to take it and how to move forward. But I think the, the most, the worst piece of feedback I've ever gotten was that I was too ambitious. And I was given that feedback in an interview process um, where I was interviewing for a large FMCG company um, right before I took my first job, my job with Beiersdorf. And so I had you know, a year under my belt, two years under my belt of work. And I was, uh, I passed two, two levels of this interview process with flying colors, the interviewers loved me. I met the last part, the third person, and his feedback to the company was, no, don't take this person. She is too ambitious for our company. And this is a large global FMCG yeah. company. And so when I heard that from the recruiter, I said, I said, what? I'm too ambitious for their company? What, is that, what does that mean? And so after a lot of back and forth, the first two interviewers overturned the third interviewer's decisions and you're crazy. Like we, we want this candidate, she's great. And so they came back to me and said, you know, actually, we withdraw that rejection and we want to ask you back again. And my response was, if there's someone within your, in, your business that, that thinks I'm too ambitious for this company, I'm a bit worried. What, is, what does that say about the company? And so in that moment, at first, it was like, like really impactful for me. It's about me. And then I thought to myself, no, this is about you. It was a, a, a filter of the way he saw the world, the way he saw the company, the filters. And that's one of the biggest things I've learned in my career. And it's um, part of a book called The Four Agreements. Yeah, so it's the four agreements to a happy life. And, and one of them is never to take anything personally because people say things in the way they view the world through the yeah. filters that, that color their life. And, you know, people could say, be saying something to you because they had a bad day, because, you know, they had different expectations. It's not easy to, to apply, but definitely in that situation, I was like, yeah, I'm not going to take for my ambition because one person, one company was felt too small for me. So I think that was the most interesting feedback I'd ever gotten. Yeah, that's, a, that's a good story. And I, I think this ambitious thing, I have a couple of guests who said the same thing around the feedback that they got on being um, very ambitious, very, very driven. Um, yeah. That's interesting. And that's a good thing about feedback, right? Is when, is the same thing I tell my team. I say, feedback is a gift. Uh, sometimes mm -hmm. what I do with my team is I try and get um, feedback from maybe different people who've interacted with them. 
Um, yeah. so it's very strange sometimes that just the range of feedback you get about one person. Um, and what I tell uh, my team is I'm sharing this with you very transparently, but it's a gift. You decide what you want to do with it, right? <laughs> you can take it, you can stew in it, or you say, hey, is this something I want to work on or not? Um, yeah. So it's, it's, it's a and strange I, I, thing to deal with. I say that even so I do a lot of workshops with my clients and an exercise we always do is the classic SWOT analysis, right? And so I always say, look, let's be very honest and transparent in the weakness quadrant with the understanding that any weakness can be transformed into a strength if you work on it. Yeah. Any opportunity as well can be transformed into a strength if we capitalize on it. So it, it, you are in charge of what you do. And a lot of the feedback I've gotten, you know, especially as a leader, you know, as a leader, running her own business, I don't have to ask anyone for feedback if I didn't want to. There's no forced 360 degree review. But one of the key things I always asked my, my team members when I did their review processes, is I was like, please prepare anything you'd like to say to me and you'd like to give me feedback on. And it's scary. It's really, really scary. You, you think it's not, you know, you, you think, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm the, you know, the, they're, I'm the person's employer. I'm the, I own this, this business. It's what, but it's no matter what, actually as a leader, I found it more daunting to get feedback than as a um, employee, because as well, I'm responsible for these people's happiness and their well-being at work. Yeah. And I'm very much, um, I love people to be happy and I love people around me to be enjoying what they do, especially uh, as it relates to, you know, obviously working for a company I've built. So that was always the more daunting thing is getting feedback <laughs> from the people who work for me, not the people who not climbing mean, client feedback is uh, client feedback is always really about managing expectations. Um, I would say that to anybody who runs their business as well is if you've been really transparent along the way, um, if you've been really open with what they can expect, I mean, I've many, many times I've rejected business because I knew what that client was asking for was mm. not something they were going to get from the type of services I do, especially people when it comes to marketing, it's such a wide spectrum of services. You can get really quick fixes yeah. from things like, you know, social media or paid advertising or, or things like that. And then you, there's the long game, which is where we really play, which is about strategy and, and branding and building a brand. And so for, you know, when brands come and say, I have heard so much about you, uh, I want to work with you, but you can tell they want quick fixes. I know if I'm going to work with you. You're going to be unhappy. You're going to give me bad feedback. And it's, it's just about missed expectations and you're not going to be happy. And I'm not going to be happy with that. So it's also knowing how to manage that. Yeah, absolutely. I do the same as you. I ask my team all the time, give me feedback. So when it's performance appraisal time, I say, we're going to talk about you. I want you to come with at least one improvement Whoa. feedback. For it's about building a culture in which people are comfortable enough to yes. do that. Yes. You know, I'm preparing for a, a client workshop next week and the, the, it's a, it's a 40 person business. It's a you know, small size, a mid sized business. And the founder was saying to me, do you think I should be there? Mm -hmm. And I said, why, why wouldn't you be there? And he said, I'm just worried that no one will be on it. People won't be as honest as they would be if I was there yeah. and I said, if you're confident in the culture that you've built in the fact that you've taken care of your people yeah. and the fact that you've always listened, I'm sure it'll be fine. You know, don't worry too much, you know, have confidence in the fact that you've done all the right things, especially if you're thinking to the point where you're concerned about them having an open forum that already says you're, you're consider enough about what yeah. they want to say. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. Um, and I, I do think it's, um, um, I wouldn't say it's just a woman only thing, but um, I feel that women are happy to get that improvement feedback. I, I'm actually seeking it out. Like, tell me mm -hmm. it's in the, in the, in the moment you hear it, it gives you a jolt, but if you take mm -hmm. time, process it and do something with it, of course, not feedback like, Hey, you're very ambitious. That adds no value, but if it's good feedback, it's really worth it. Especially because I mean, we, you know, historically with the boys clubs, especially in industries that are male dominated, feedback was given, um, was given casually in yeah. conversation over yes. lunches, over, you know, tidbits and tips and tricks and whatever. So it doesn't even have to be the, the formal review process. Yeah. So it can be that along the way we ask our mentors inside, in, you know, inside a company, our sponsors inside a company, or even just colleagues just hey you know what do you think what are you doing exchanging information so it's um, yeah. feedback can come from all sources absolutely um 
so talking about that, um, your part, your um, kind of co-founder, co-president of the Dubai chapter for the Elevate Network, Maya, can you talk a bit about that, your role there? And I, I'm really curious, you must be interacting with a number of um, um, uh, women, right, um, in who are yeah. working with their own businesses. Do you, have you experienced or have you heard about uh, stereotypes and assumptions and biases and, um, you know, what, what has been the experience and how do, how, what are some good examples as well of how uh, people have dealt with it? Yeah, um, so the Elevate Network is a global network headquartered in New York, which is dedicated to helping women take the next step in their career. We focus on supporting women on two, um, in two things, which is education, helping them continue to sharpen their skills, to learn more, both soft skills and um, you know, technical skills, and uh, also helping them to network because like I mentioned, the boys clubs of the past, um, women have not formalized these kind of network or in the, you know, in, it's, it's good for women to formalize these networks and build their own network um, through, through organizations like this. So I had the Dubai chapter I have done since 2019. Um, it's about women are excellent at networking. We are not as good at leveraging our networks. And this is something that was um, discussed in uh, the book, How Women Rise uh, mm -hmm. by Sally Helgeson, which is a fantastic, fantastic book about the habits that hold women back. And we, we love people. We love to build, I mean, for the most part, women love building relationships. We love growing our networks, but we don't ask anything of our networks. We find it, we're embarrassed to send someone an email and say, listen, I'm looking for a job or I need, you know, my business is struggling today. And I, I you know, I would love an intro to anyone, you know, who could use this. I found even at the beginning of, of when I started my business, I would talk to strangers happily about what I did. I'd really be embarrassed to talk about it in front of my friends. <laughs> you know, because it's like this is humble. You have to be humble, yes. not, not dominate a conversation, not talk too much about what you do. There's so many intricacies to why we feel that way. But so that's one thing that we aim to break down at Elevate a lot is ask, ask your network, ask your network. And um, I'll tell a little anecdote before I, I get back to more about Elevate about asking. But my first time as a manager, uh, when I was again at, at Byersdorf, I had a, a my first reportee was a, was, a, was a man, was a male, a bit younger than me, but uh, in his first job and, and really energetic and passionate. And he would constantly ask for things. Mm. And I'm talking, ask for parking, ask for this, ask for that. You know, he was constantly asking for things to be done differently, asking for things that would benefit him, um, not in a, in a annoying way or not in a really like offensive way but he was always asking yeah. asking why can't we do things this way why can't we add this service why can't I have a parking spot etc etc and one day I said to him I said you know you really need to tone it down with like how much you're asking for things because people are going to start like they're going to not pay attention to the important asks you're making mm -hmm. um, because you're making just so many asks and he looked at me and he said something that I've never forgotten my whole career and he said if I don't ask the answer is already no yeah. If I do ask, I have a 50% chance of getting a yes. Mm -hmm. And I've never forgotten that. I've never forgotten that every time I've been afraid to ask for something. So you learn, again, you learn from everywhere, right? Yes. This, yeah. I it's a wise young man. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so Elevate is, is um, a wonderful network for women of all walks of life, of all walks of career to join. Um, so what do I see there in terms of, you know, how women are, are, women face a lot of the same issues, okay, regardless of um, where they are and what kind of walk of life they're in. Um, and a lot of it has to do with, you know, things that are not in our control, um, things like the employer biases and uh, systems, you know, uh, thank, as terrible as COVID was, COVID has been terrible for women on so many levels. But one of the great things is the ability to now re work remotely for a lot of companies um, has allowed more flexibility for women than they've had before, um, which is great. So I'm seeing the main issue that I'm seeing this year in particular, 2021, 2022, is women who've taken a gap, who've had maternity leave, who've taken a career gap for any reason, are really struggling to get their foot in the door. They're not struggling when they get in the interviews. They're not struggling when they actually get the job. Yeah. They're really struggling to 
even be invited for an interview. Okay, um, that's uh, that's interesting. I'm, I've I've heard this before as well. Um, and I know uh, my company, uh, G, had started a um, few years back. We did this um, program called, I think it was Return to Work or something like that. We got some really you know, strong, amazing women back into the workforce. Um, and I think companies just need to do more of that, like actually understanding that there is that segment of women, right? You took a break for some reason or the other, uh, but they have great experience. Um, of strong credibility how do we bring them back into the workforce and yeah, you know, it's sure. going to be an it's, asset it's a it's a huge loss of productivity yeah. of, of talent for an economy if women are are moved aside and so you'll see um you'll see organizations like women at work um that uh, that that dedicate themselves to helping women uh, yeah. get back into the yeah. corporate world or get back on their, you know, get back into the, the corporate ladder after a break. Um, but the fact that it has to be such an active effort, it really does, you know, there have to be these return to work programs. You know, it's, we can't put the onus on women only to change the way you are, lean in and, and yeah. get out there and, and, you know, put your hand up. Women are doing all of that. They're yeah. banging on the door and we, we, we just need, you know, we need the door to be opened. And, and that's why I really, push back on the phrase women's empowerment, which still today is used so often. Women yeah. don't need to be empowered. Correct. Women don't need to be empowered. Give us space. Give us space to, to, um, to be, to show what we can do. Give us a seat at the table. Um, we, I don't need you to empower me. I have a lot to say. And I have a lot to contribute. Absolutely. Um, I think, you know, um, you said something very uh, good, right? You said it, we actually don't sometimes we, we shy away from leveraging our networks. I think I, I do that mm -hmm. personally as well. Um, and, you know, I'm curious, you are a business owner, right? You obviously have to go out there and sell and market your business. Does that yeah. come to you naturally? Did you have to work on it? Aha, <laughs> as a marketer, you know, as a marketer marketing her business, right? <laughs> We always have a saying, we have a saying in Arabic that the carpenter's door is always broken, right? So um, yeah, of course, I mean, B2B business development is very different to a B2C, like business to consumer um, marketing. So it was definitely a learning process along the way um, because it also, it, it you know, people talk about shameless self-promotion. You know, when I started, I was an individual consultant and I was just someone who had no track record and I was having to put out blog posts and pose myself as an expert and show how I understood. And, you know, for some people, it's like, well, who are you? But you have to keep at that. And, and, and also, even if people never had any negative feelings about that, you tell yourself, oh, who am I to be putting out all of this stuff and to be portraying myself as an expert, especially when, you know, when you're first starting out. Um, so I've been very, very, I don't want to use the term lucky because it has to do with performance, not, not only luck. I was lucky in the sense that I got that first consulting gig, um, but that was based on what I use, uh, what I call inbound or what is called inbound marketing. So inbound marketing is the process of creating marketing content that is valuable to your audience, that positions you as a thought leader. And that basically you serve as a lighthouse for others who are seeking what you offer. So rather than you chasing clients, you stand in your place, you put out all this content that showcases your expertise and what you can do. You're clear on your messaging. And that's really, really important is that you know what you want people to perceive you as and to know about you. Um, and, and then people over time after hearing these messages time and time again will start coming to you. So that's been the process that I've really followed. I focus a lot on content creation. I focus a lot on doing speaking events, um, doing, uh, you know, I, I do a lot of video content creation. I do a lot of written content creation. I contribute to magazines and to newspapers about marketing. I, I'm on the radio. Uh, so I do a lot to to position myself as a thought leader to showcase my expertise. Uh, and so what I've done is always said, okay, what are the companies that I really want to work with that I think I could really benefit that would be dream clients, write all of those down and find a way to pitch them, 
find a way that I can add value and approach them about that and see if, if I can find someone within my network who can introduce me or just go directly cold emailing or cold contacting, which is definitely not the best approach. Usually I, I try to have someone introduce me, which is um, always more successful. But yeah, it's, it's um, a, a different mentality. You have to be really accepting of having the door closed in your face. And I, I again, I referenced Sarah Blakely of Spanx and how often she was told no no, we, this is a stupid idea. No, it was like, I think she, she was like over 200 times that she was told no by factories. They didn't want to produce it. So you have to get really comfortable with the rejection, really comfortable rejection. I like how you, you kind of, you stuck to your style, right? Um, you said you, you, you contribute a lot to magazines. You're kind of putting original content out there. Um, so I think what I'm hearing is you're staying true to yourself. You're not trying. You're not trying to be in authentic. Step out of who you are just to go and get that business, right? And get that new client. Uh, you're finding your own way to do it. I think I don't think it's about authenticity as well. Um, you know, I think I've always been. I started my blog back then, which was called the Marketing Spark, to help businesses. Mm -hmm. That was my goal. You know, my goal was to put out educational content that would help somebody. Yeah. And um, that's always been part of my e education's always been a big part of my business ethos. And so I, I really believe as a marketer, I say this is that if you've really identified an audience, you know who your audience is um, and you know how you can benefit them and you pair those two things, that's the core belief. That's the core function of marketing. You know, marketing isn't just about advertising. Marketing is about the seven P's of marketing, product, price, place, promotion. I won't rattle them all off. And it's about finding the right product for the right people at the right price, at the right time, in the right place, all those things. It's making the perfect package. Yeah. So if you know who your audience is and you're putting out really authentic, of course, and, and truthful and helpful content, people will see that and, and they will gravitate towards it and they will you know i uh, i spend a lot of times answering questions on forums and somebody asks me why do you do that for free mm. you know you <laughs> these people are actually you know you could you it's your time yeah. why do you do speaking events for free i do a lot of free speaking events and they say you know you could be charging and i say you know what i've can't tell you the number of times I've gotten emails. And when I ask people, how did you hear about me? These are people who become clients. Yeah. They say, I noticed you always answer questions on the forums, like this specific forum. I noticed that you were always helpful. You don't gatekeep information. You know, you really try to be helpful without asking for anything in return. And that appealed to me. And this is a person I've never interacted with before. It's not yeah. someone whose question I answered. Yeah. But again, because you're trying to actually be helpful to your audience, they see that. Okay, that's a, that's a really good uh, insight there, Maya. I just love how you're combining your you know, personal ethos along with your uh, something that you're passionate about, right? So it's not yeah. just, it's, it's not always about this is what I get paid to do. So. It, it, I mean, it, it comes back, right? Yeah. It comes yeah, exactly. back. So yeah. um, I have to acknowledge that I'm fortunate enough to be able to financially not have to charge for things like that. You know, other people are not in that position. So I do acknowledge that. But, you know, if you're able to, to, to donate your time to educate people and you're doing it, because sometimes with these speaking events as well, when people do free speaking events, it's so clearly a pitch and they give you the tip of the iceberg, yeah. nothing really valuable. And you're like, why did I come to this event? You know, you're obviously just trying to get me to buy more from you. It's like, no, you can buy my book for, you know, $99 or, or download my digital course. And, and, and I get that. I really do. But give a little bit more. Give something that's actually worthwhile for someone's time. Be respectful of people's time. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. So Maya, you talk a bit about your leadership style, right? Um, maybe share a bit more. How do you lead, um, right? Has it And has it evolved over time like, since when you started out to where you are today? Uh, how did you consciously work on that as well? Uh, so um, I've always said my, my superpower is being able to galvanize people with an idea. So I'm a big, I'm a big, big picture thinker. I can see it. I can see the vision. I've always been the strategy person. I hate nitty gritty execution. Um, 
And at the same time, unfortunately, I'm also, uh, I have the, the flaw of being a quote unquote perfectionist. So I, I need to be also doing the nitty gritty <laughs> execution myself sometimes. So I'm, I'm, I, I love kind of getting people excited behind an idea, helping them see how they can contribute to the idea, how they play a role in that as well. So that's always been really my approach, but my big learning over the, the years of, of you know, being a, a business owner with, with having team members is I came to the realization in 2019 that if I'm gonna grow my firm, I'm not really a marketer anymore, or I can't only be a marketer. Yeah. Meaning that I can't be the one who does all the client work. I am a managing you know, director. I'm the person who's managing these people. I have to care about um, how they're growing, their skill sets, how they're growing personally and emotionally, how they're feeling. I have to be the one business developing. I have to be on the business and not in the business. And that was my real, like, that's the really big learning. And, and also one of the great things that I've tried to learn to become in my leadership is that perfection is the enemy of excellence. You know, we, as a, a leader, you always think oh, sometimes I could have done that better. I can do that better. I'll do it myself. And women more so than men have been proven to, they, um, they try to do too much. Uh, you know, men try to do more because they're afraid of like losing power and control. Women do more in their companies because they're just like, I can do it better. I can do it better. I know how to do this. This is my expertise. Yeah. Give it to me. I'll be faster. You know, yeah. I would say really, I'm, I'm a work in progress as a leader. Um, I'm trying really hard to step back uh, and not, you know, not be involved in the execution and really trust people to make their decisions and, and make their mistakes. And that's the hardest thing, I think, as a business owner, because mistakes cost money. And so when you're in a big corporate company, you don't really ever feel that like, yeah, you made a mistake, you got a bad review, et cetera. The money company lost some money, but there's no, nobody really tangibly gets impacted by that. Whereas when people make mistakes and I have to pay the price for them as the business owner, I have to, you know, the buck stops with me and yeah. you would never throw someone under the bus from your team. You have to just own it uh, with the right. client and say, okay, we, we made a mistake here. Here's the cost. And um, yeah, so, so really it's just it's letting people make their mistakes, letting people learn and do things in their own way for them. Otherwise people just feel like they're, they're cogs in a, you know, and they're, 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 they're not really contributing anything. There's no room to grow. Yeah, um, absolutely. I like what you said about being work in progress, right? I think the one term that I deliberately kind of stopped, have stopped using is this uh, you know, superwoman. And we all... <laughs> Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, uh, oh, you're superwoman because you can do this, 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 and I just that puts so much pressure um, on on you, right? When you say, "Oh my God, yeah. so things I'm superwoman," so now I have to do even better. So you know what? I'm going to take on five more things. Plus, I'll do things at home. I'll do things with the family. Yeah. I'll get the house in order. It's just just too much pressure. I think we just need to acknowledge we're all women, people in progress, right? We're all work in progress. It's okay. That's fine. Okay. Really I, I, I had an internal conversation with myself before coming on this podcast. And I said, you know, there's two ways you can, you can do these interviews. Because I, I've done interviews before, right? You can, oh, you always put your best foot forward where you're like, these are my amazing things. Of course, I've learned along the way. But here's how I'm so fantastic right now. Yeah. But the truth is everybody knows they have areas to grow and everybody, I mean, it's only when we look back and see everything we've achieved that we're like, wow, I actually have come a long way, but it's also good to say, here's where I messed up. Here's where I tripped because it's humanizing and it's, it's comforting to people to see, you know, that failure happens and it's not the end of the world, um, that you can get up and, and do something totally different. I mean, who would have thought that the fact that I, I, mean, I set up this tech company and the fact that I met so many business owners who had no idea what they were doing on marketing would lead to my, what, what I'm doing today, yeah. you know? Uh, everything happens that way. And, and so being honest with the fact that some days you don't know what you're doing, some days you have no idea, um, that's, that's really, really important to help others learn and learn that what they're feeling is okay. It's okay, right, absolutely. Um, I think that's kind of all um, I had. I enjoyed our conversation. Um, I don't think I missed anything. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think we've had a really great, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at the time and time has flown by. It's been over an hour. We've been chatting. <laughs> 
you you had some really good stories i love how you walk through your experience you, you, uh, some really good uh, insights in there thank you for sharing your experience you. with us maya yes. you're you know, welcome and another hum- another humanizing thing as well i have a 3 year old knocking on the door right now trying to get into my office you know so <laughs> don't worry people if you're also on an important call and you know you have your little child as knocking on the door it happens to everyone <laughs> who doesn't like to see a cute little kid <laughs> yeah, well, see, I'm glad I locked the door, so it's okay. <laughs> well, thanks a lot, Maya. I really enjoyed our conversation. I'm sure our audience will as well. Uh, and Thank have a great Samira. rest of your weekend. You too.